an interview with Albert A. Exendine, former All-American Ann from Carlisle and retired football coach for several colleges and major universities. Albert is from Tulsa, Oklahoma. This interview is being made at the First National Bank in Yale, Oklahoma on September the 30th, 1972. Your interviewer is Robert Bish, curator of the Jim Thorpe poem in Yale, Oklahoma. Mr. Exendine, can you describe for us the personality and character of Jim Thorpe? I can, after a fashion, yes. All right, would you like to tell us something about uh, Jim, about his uh, strengths and his weaknesses? What kind of a person he was? Yes, but I'd rather start from the beginning when I first met him, when I first That's came to fine. Carlisle. That's a good place to start. First place, I think I should state that I preceded uh, Jim Thorpe to Carlisle by four years. And I was four years older than Jim Thorpe. And uh, I came to Carlisle in, in 1900. And Jim Thorpe didn't come to Carlisle until 1904. And of course, in the meantime, when I came to Carlisle, of course, uh, I participated in athletics of all kind. But, uh, and of course, I owed uh, most of the track records there. For instance, in high jump, broad jump, shot put, hammer throw, discus, and whatnot. I held all the records there, and uh, so in 1904, in the meantime, I also played football, and I was a captain of the Carlisle team when Jim Sh Sh Thorpe showed up. He was a very smallish lad. He weighed only about 115 pounds, but uh, <coughs> didn't look like much like a athlete. Matter of fact, he wasn't. He's too small. Cut off. Of course, uh, of course, run and operated by uh, Presbyterian Church, and. Uh, he preached at Danny Darkhorse. His name was Reverend S. V. Fate. And he had to be the superintendent of this uh, Presbyterian school called Maul Tame uh, Mission School. And uh, you got to turn that thing off. <laughs> anyway, that summer, uh, he came to see me, and we were living on what you call a place called Lake Creek. Lake Creek was, uh, was northwest of Anadarko, about 35 miles. And uh, we were living on that creek, and we were about the only people, we were the only people living on that whole creek that somebody did it, uh, a land, country. And, uh, but, and the nearest house to our place was a, a colony 
Oklahoma. Colony Oklahoma is the uh, is the was the agency for the Cheyenne Arapaho country, and uh, they had a school there, and there's where Major Pratt uh, preached. I mean, not Major Pratt, me. I mean, Reverend uh, uh, Fate. That's where he preached. So every Sunday we would students from a more tame in school would get on a big bus drawn by about six horses and go over there and we'd go to that church and of course uh, we were the choir we were singing the choir in the church but uh, anyway going away from that after the summer came along, I was on the farm. Here come uh, Joe Tramp with a nice team of horses and a buggy. And I was glad to see him. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm ready to go to Carlisle. He says, can you go with me? I said, no, I haven't asked my father yet. I can't. I can't say what I <laughs> am. I doing all right? That's fine. Just go right ahead. Uh, I want to get that part of it straightened out. But uh, anyway, I told him I have to ask my father to go there and and told him, and I said, "You go to Carlisle then." And uh, write and let me know how you like the school. And uh, in the meantime, I'll ask my father if I can go there. So he did. He went to Carlisle and wrote me a month or two afterward and told me what a wonderful school it is and wanted me to come up there. Well, I got uh, my older brother to tell my father that I wanted to go to school at Calais, Pennsylvania. He ought to know where that was and so on. And uh, told him, now you go to the agency there and find out uh, what, what it would take to get him to the school and so on. So he did. He went to the agency at Anadarko, and the agency said, yes, and yes. He said, that's a, we can send your boy up there, but he has to stay there five years. If he stays there five years, they'll uh, pay his transportation there and back and clothe him and uh, take care of all the expenses paid. He says if he comes back sooner than that, well, uh, he says uh, the moon pay his way back. So my father told my brother, I said, well, the next time you go there, I said, you see the agent and tell him that I only sent Albert there for five years. I mean, that's because he didn't want me to go, but that is his way, you know, being it. He wants to go, he says, I'll just send him. So I went to Carlisle and I stayed there five years. When I entered the Carlisle school, uh, the funny part, when I got and see Carlisle is about 18 and a half miles south of, uh, of uh, Harrisburg. Yeah, Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania. So I got there in the evening, went over and had my had my uh, nice something nice to eat, and 
got on another train that took me down to Cumberland Valley to Carlisle, 18 miles away. When I got there, it was dark after dark, and uh, when the conductor said all out for Carlisle, I got out with the rest of them and asked where the school was, uh, and they told me well, it was about a mile or two from the station. And he said, there's a bus coming over there. He says, if you get, jump that bus, it says it'll take you right to the school. Well, I jumped, uh, I jumped the bus, and uh, it took me to school. When I got off, I started down, the st down uh, straight ahead, eastward. There was a huge building there, huge building to my right. Building all right, but I went straight ahead, and it is dark. It must be nine or uh, ten o'clock. The lights already turned out off, and I saw one light there. I walked in there, and there's a lady uh, sitting there, and I knocked, walked in. She said, "New student?" I said, "Yes." And he says, well, he says, you happen to be in the girls' quarters. These are girls' dormitories here. But he says, that, uh, now he says that uh, uh, we have the small boys' dormitory right, right across the street over here. The large boys' dormitory is uh, north of us here. She looked me over and says, I think perhaps you, they would, they'd keep you in a large boys' quarters. So I went down to large boys' quarters. And there was only one light lit, and that was the, the disciplinarian's office. Went in there, and he says, uh, I walked in. He also has a new student. I said, yes. I said, where are you from? He says, uh, Oklahoma. He says, you know anybody there? Yeah. He said, yes. He said, I know Joe Traft from uh, Colony, Oklahoma. He said, yes, he's one of our main boys there. See, it had been, been only two or three months so He says, one of our main boys. So he said, follow me. So uh, that was three-story building, so I followed him and uh, went down the hall and he went clear to the other end of that big, long building. See, these were the military barracks at that time. And as I walked down there, well, it seemed like everybody along the way had opened their doors and looked out to see who it was. I guess they knew it was a student. He got to the corner and uh, and uh, yelled out, Joe Trapp, somebody from Oklahoma has come to see you. I guess he was expecting me. And boy, I heard his feet hit the floor. Finally, there he came. Of course, he, we embraced each other there and he yelled out that the uh, introduced me to the whole crowd. Everything was a big crowd there, boys. <coughs> and uh, it so happened that Joe Travis so well liked that he was uh, rooming with a captain in a corner. He had a huge room. So I was there while this captain told the orders there, says, Joe Tramp suggested, why not? Well, he suggested, he said, we can put him in our room. So he ordered another bed put in that room. And uh, there I was, pretty good company, see. Couldn't have been better company. And of course, Carlisle was, is a military school. And Joe told me all about the school, that you had to take steps and march every place you went. You had to go military fashion. So he told her, 
showed me how to keep step and so on. I uh, went to breakfast the next morning with him, you know, and I was keeping step with the rest of them, see. And one thing, too, uh, they were surprised that I could use such good English. Well, a lot of those students there couldn't even talk English. That's the kind of school we had, see. In other words, Carlisle was not a college, not a university, not even a high school. It was a, more of a trade school than anything else. See. It was an academic and, uh, uh, school there. So uh, turn it over. Go ahead. I have, to, I have to collect my thoughts, man. You better turn that thing off for a minute. I woke up. Uh, he wanted me to uh, take me to the superintendent, Major R. H. Pratt. Uh, he became, the, he was then the superintendent of the school. And uh, now, in the earlier days, he was one of the soldiers located in Anadarko and working among the Indians there. And uh, of course, he became very sympathetic with the Indians and how they were being treated, being handled very roughly with the uh, from, with, from the soldiers. And uh, of course they were on the reservation. Now then, why the reservation was established is uh, another question. But uh, the best reason for Indians being put on reservation is that they were on this reservation and the government wanted that land on which to uh, to put the immigrants that were coming into this country, and of course the fact they had reservations, they came without authority, and they were having a lot of trouble with the Indians, and the Indians had uh, was trying to put them on reservations so there wouldn't be any difficulty arising from the, from the incoming uh, immigrants and the, and, the, um, and the Indians. Of course, by putting them on reservations, I mean, <coughs> reservations and keeping them there, that enabled the, uh, the immigrants to go out and move on to the land which is being vacated by the uh, by the Indians. And of course they also said that uh, that it was for the protection of the Indians. Well it ran both ways. When the white people moved on the, the reservation the Indians uh, protested and they had some trouble difficulties so after a while the the decision was made that we, that they would imprison the leaders 
of the Indians who were causing all this uh, difficulty. So they took about 75 of the leaders and they took them out to Florida and imprisoned them there, see, for three years. And, uh, of course, uh, when they imprisoned them there, they took them down in chains. They were, they were in chains. <coughs> so, and they ordered R.H. Pratt to be in charge of the Indians, and he did. And about the first thing he did, he asked permission to remove these chains from the Indians because he had confidence in them that they couldn't run off, they couldn't get away, and they did. He became more uh, sympathetic with them. He gave them something to do. He started a school there to see if any of them could uh, <coughs> learn English first place and see if any of them could learn to read and write. And of course, they made good progress. After that, uh, <coughs> about three years, he became a teacher as well as a, as a charge of the Indians. He had a school there, see. And the young people, see, learned to talk first, see. And then when they learned to talk, they also learned to uh, read, write just a little bit. So I uh, found it out. He asked to be relieved from that service. And we got to it and said, no, he said, we want to keep you there. And we want you to, uh, to head a school. All right. Now then, the, he agreed to do so. And he looked for a location. So during the Civil War, Carlisle, They, they had barracks, military barracks, at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And uh, Major Pratt went over to look at this military bar barracks, and he saw it there. Wonderful country. She always had pictures of it. Wonderful country. It is uh, in a valley called Cumberland Valley. There's one educational institution from Harrisburg on way down, see, different towns, you know. And uh, on the, there were hills and mountains to the east, and hills and mountains to the west. In between was this beautiful valley. There's where Carlisle was, uh, was located. And uh, after staying night there and marching to, to my breakfast, well, Joe Tramp says, "Extra very welcome to see the superintendent. So we went up to see the superintendent, R.H. R. Pratt. And I'm telling you right now that I never saw such a magnetic person in my life. He was just wonderful. You won't know where it's from, and it's our call.
Yes, he knew all Anadarko, uh, other places there. And uh, that's where and the wild Indians come from, I say. They're really down there, yet you know, long hair and so on. I'll have to interject this right here before I begin my talk. They had uh, uh, among the Indians, they were incorporated a sycamore tribes here. Mm -hmm. You know what a sycamore Indian is, do you? <laughs> anyway, he is a white person that lives among the Indians and is a friend of them among the Indians and perhaps is intermarriage. The fact that uh, he likes Indians and he lives among them and he acts like him. Well, uh, but he's a white man, just like a sycamore tree is. Uh, you see it so plainly, one white tree among the black trees, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's what an Indian is. So he's a sort of white person among the reds. So they named him after the sycamore. And so some of them were long hair and so on. So we have a heck of a lot of sycamore Indians now, see, the people that are wearing long hair. <laughs> <laughs> Our population has increased. Okay, you got that on? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, next morning, yes, I repeat, we are up to see me, uh, Pratt. He was a wonderful fellow, got where he was from, and so on, so he said he'd been there, he knows all those Indians. And uh, among other things, says, well, you like uh, baseball, football, and so on? I said, well, yes, he says, I like to play baseball. I'm not a good player, but he says, I don't know what football is. What is that? He says, oh, you'll learn, my boy. You'll learn. And uh, I didn't know what he's talking about. So uh, after that, I asked Trump what, what that big football was and so on. He told me, well, there's some pretty good players there, but anyway, for the first year, I didn't come out. 1900 months, I didn't come out. But uh, next year, I came out for football. Well, no. Instead of turning out for varsity football, uh, each department, see, we have all these. Uh, uh, The shops and so on. For instance, you could go take up any trade you wanted to, see. They haven't mentioned a uh, baker shop. Well, I thought about it, you know, I believe I'll take a baker shop. Because I'd at least get plenty to eat. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. I took a big shop. I learned how to make bread. Of course, those things in great big fashion. We made our yeast out of potato chips. Potatoes use chips, you know, boy. That's our yeast. Then finally quit that, and uh, I decided I'd take up blacksmithing. I was thinking, well, see, this bright head. His idea was away now. He said, now you're right here. What you've got to do is to learn some trade or something. You've got a farm. He says, you need to, uh, if you've got a farm, you need to uh, fix up your plowshares and whatnot and so on. So 
blacksmith shop be a good trade for you. So I did take up blacksmithing. I learned to shoe a horse. I learned to sharpen the flowers. I made to weld anything. I saw it. I'd have been a wonderful hand at a, at a farm, see, because I could do all the necessary things that need to be done in order to, to operate a farm. Anyway, uh, when uh, But uh, in May was a time for the students to go out in what they call the outing system. He had what's called there the outing system, where he went out and worked, lived among the white people. Now the first place, uh, Major Pratt's auto was, uh, in order to civilize an Indian, put him into civilization. In order to keep him civilized, let him stay. And uh, so that's what the government's doing, this moving the Indians here and there, you know, and put them back on the reservation. So, uh, so he didn't leave that first place. He was down on reservations in the shape of form. Oh, he was done with it. So, uh, they said that when summertime came, he tried an experiment there. He made an advertisement to advertise that we had Indian boys and girls, I have seen, uh, who needed to go out in the country uh, learned it all King this one place. It says, we have Indians here in our shops who are expert tailors. Shops who are expert tailors. they expert blacksmiths. they expert carpenters. They can do anything, see. So we want, we want a place to there's a apprentice to learn this trade. Now, and going out, he'll, he'll have to abide by the rules and regulations of the school. You, we won't turn this first over to you to, uh, to teach. I mean, so uh, he received a wonderful response. He was sent out there, and that one, I enjoyed it. Uh, the response been so great, it sent students to throughout Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and uh, other towns on that. And from the part of the thing you did is he sent, they went to the best families that were in, uh, in those states. And they went over and lived with them as one of the uh, members of the family, say. And uh, if you were a Presbyterian, that's where I was, I went to three, four Presbyterian families. I lived with them. They treated me as really a son, see, because I know how to behave myself, and they really res respected me, and I loved it. And uh, if you were a Catholic, they said he had a Catholic school, uh, Democrat, Democrat, I mean, church, and so on. It was a, it was a experience uh, was so invaluable to England. We have not had anything like it since then. And when they abolished finally abolished the Indian schools. They sent the Indian problem back a hundred years, no question about it. They sent them way back to you because we had no... In other words, Major Pratt's here.
Major Pratt, when he agreed to uh, establish the school, he made a sort of ironclad agreement with the Secretary of the Interior and other powers that be that he would run the school provided he could run the school as it should be run and uh, should be run and he could uh, employ who he wanted to employ see and of course that's what it did when uh, anybody wanted employment teach that school he would they would have to he'd interview him see now, why do you want to go to Indian school? Why don't you go to the white school? You're a white person. These are Indians. Why do you want to associate with them? Well, he'd find out, really, whether or not they wanted to teach and help the Indians or whether they wanted to go there just for a job, see. You know, we have a lot of people in this world will work for anything, see, uh, even though they don't like their work. I mean, they take a soft job for a good salary, but uh, he wouldn't have any of that, see. They had to uh, help the Indian in school and out of school and teach them thrift and teach them ambition that kind of incentive to uh, to advance themselves and uh, so in a way on day before they uh, uh, the day before they went out in this outing system he called them together and had a huge dormitory in boys quarters or a huge dormitory and he got there and talked to them and he said, now, he says, you're going out now on what we call the outing system. In this system, he says, we have patrons here, board and met them. And he says, they're willing to take you. And he says, uh, into their families. They'll treat you, he says, just like they do one of their own children, see. And he says, it's up to you to uh, what, look at him, watch where they live, see, because sometime you, you're going to get married and live with and have a family, and it says you can raise your family, and that, he says, it's like they raise their family, see, be a, be a big education. And, uh, Anyway, I went to uh, three or four different schools. Now, uh, the first school, one of the big benefits I got out was this. One day, the uh, uh, my employer, his name was William Leadham. I remember his name so well. William Leadham. He says, Albert, we're going to dig potatoes today. I said, well, I says, Mr. Leadham, I says, we, we need a lot of help, won't, won't we? He says, oh, yes, he says, we need a lot of help. But he says, all we need to do is start plowing up there. And he says, there'll be a lot of people wanting jobs. Uh, well, I, I was sort of disbelief, you know, and so on. But uh, so enough, started applying here, about six or seven men came up there. And he said, go ahead, fly, yes. Do you want the potato pickers? I said, oh, yes. So he hired the whole bunch. There were seven of them there. And uh, they started applying. And I will say this is Mr. Leadham was the fastest hardest working man I ever saw. When he started to put these fellas in there to dig potatoes, he'd go in there and throw a potato out here and throw a potato out there and out there. And they'd keep up. 
And then he put me in there to lead him, see. I was going fast, too. Finally, one of the fellows spoke up. He says, young man, let me tell you something. The horse is gone now. He says, I don't care how fast you go. He said, we're going to keep up with you. But he says, if we keep up with you, we're going to miss a lot of potatoes. I was only a kid, about 16 years old. I just know that. Now he says, I tell you, what do we do? Let's get dig deep. There's a lot of good potatoes here, see? And throw them out and show it and uh, see how much praise we get. And I said, but your old boss would be pleased to see the, all these potatoes. So enough, he didn't come back until uh, about noon. And he saw the difference all the audiences of being pretty heavy potato there. And there were bunches of potatoes all the way through. And he was quite pleased. So uh, anyway, the fellow's instruction was this. He says, you will find out that it'll pay him to have us go slowly and dig all the potatoes in there. See, that's what it's for, see? And he'll profit by it rather than go fast and miss them all. And uh, something else happened. But he says, all right, now we're going slowly. Let's, uh, let's discuss something. Let's debate something. He says, all right. Boy, they were well talking to people. My ears are open, you know. <laughs> And they say, what shall we debate? Let's debate the immigration question. And I said, boy, I said, good. He says, that's the live subject today. Matter of fact, while working there, was not too far from, uh, from uh, Philadelphia, see, that uh, weekdays, I'd go there Saturdays and Sundays, and we'd set, and as soon as the thing's over, I'd go to Philadelphia, and I'd uh, see those uh, immigrants coming in. Oh, you side now, Philadelphia, here yeah, I'm out here, so we're going to make a store right here. Another store, that's how you speak, one make a store. And there's a great, big, wide uh, interest going east and west. And there was another highway going this way, see. The immigrants that come in there, the boy, we want something. They'd have all their worldly possessions on their backs. So some are carrying pots and the others carrying this and carrying that thing. And I used to love to come out there and just look at them, see. Look at them. I said, where in the world are they going? So on. Where are they coming from? Where they came from all over, all over the country. I didn't know where they were going to. I couldn't talk to them. They couldn't talk English language. Didn't they? more than you talk Delaware. So, uh, anyway, yeah. Oh, all right, now I says, what should be the question? Well, one of them spoke up. He says, all right, I'll give a question, immigration. And this is the immigration question he, he spit out to you. He's resolved that legislation should be enacted to further restrict and control immigration. Spit out just like that, see. I thought myself, I know, I've been seeing a lot of that. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of that. And uh, so I said, well, that's a fine question. He says, all right. He says, now, what about sight? Well, he says, it's, uh, so many of us here, see? He says, you choose your side, and I'll choose my side. He says, all right. So this fellow's talking to him, he said, all right, I'll take the affirmative side. I said, all right, I'll take the negative side. And uh, then they chose 
each one chose, chose two more men, see. And the third one, I think he was sort of a judge. And uh, they had it on as the base you ever saw. And my ears are open. I could think then, see. And uh, anyway, long story short, I continue that. I got back to school. I, if Grace hadn't opened her mouth, I'd had pictures of it. See, I could show you, see, this. We had uh, four debating societies. One of them was the uh, Invincible Debating Society. That's what I belonged to. And the other was Standard Debating Society. That's uh, among the boys, see. And the girls had two debating society, literary society. So they started there. The first thing they done there was they put on some photo on declamatory contest, see, then declamation. And so I'll get there and try to uh, make it recite a declamation. <laughs> they couldn't talk English and sound like that, you know, see? <laughs> I remember one fellow in particular. His name was George Washington. He was on a program. When Thorpe came to Carlisle, he was a little bit of just a kid. And he weighed no more than about uh, 115 pounds, very skinny, tall but skinny. And uh, they sent him out in the country called the outing system. And uh, he was there four years without returning. When he returned, we were having an athletic uh, chair meeting and I was leading the, the chairing. And we looked up here come um, a nice built young man, see, carrying a little bit of a grip outside of that. And uh, of course, I was so glad to see him, you know. I knew he, he, I didn't know where he was coming from, but he was very well dressed. So that's when I went up and met him, asked him what his name is and what his Indian name is. And, so on. So uh, at that time, you say I was captain of the football team, but the uh, 1906, but the football season was over when he arrived. But I told Pop about him, and Pop saw me and he told me, he said, Now, X, you stick with Thorpe. It looks like it might be good material. And we had uh, track meets coming on, so I had him go with me, you know, and being in Oklahoma, you know, and like you are, so I, we got along very nicely. And I showed him how to uh, shot foot and hammer throw and broad jump and high jump and low hurdles and high hurdles and so on, and he did pretty well. Contrary to uh, statements I've seen that he'd go out there and break all my records. He didn't do that right away, but he finally did. See, I had all those records and uh, and I was finally disqualified. Uh, protest because I'd been in athletics quite a while, so I didn't go out. But I got right behind Starf and had this meeting on and he did wonderfully well. And uh, anyway, uh, when it came to football, it so happened that it was in 1970, before the football season started, Pop Warner always had a football practice ahead of the other of the colleges, see, because we didn't have any particular do so he was just out in football. And Pop is the first man that ever wrote wrote a football for coaches and players. And, uh, and Booker's uh, 
written in 1908. But of course, uh, we members of the football team, myself and Joe Guyon, Mainz, I thought too, and Kalak, and other fellows did the demonstrating for him. See, we demonstrated all those uh, plays, how to tackle, how to block, and so on. And uh, also at that time, yeah, football never knew anything about a charging sled, see. Pop is the first man that ever had a charging sled on a football field, see. We learned it that. And because I learned to hit it, well, he also taught us to hit low. Now then, some of the other teams used to stand up this way, see, and expect to ward off anybody else getting through it. But we got down, and I sometimes we put both hands right on the ground, see, down there. We charge into them, of course. We learned to charge on the snap of the ball. And I, in particular, was uh, playing against a fellow named Antonio Lubo. He was a part of uh, Spanish uh, name, anyway, from California. He was the quickest charger I ever saw. I charged the rest of us. He would always beat me to a charge. But I got so well, I could charge right with him, see. Well, anyway, I went out for football, and in, uh, when I did go out for football, well, uh, it so happened to Bill Warner, who, who was, uh, that is before Pop left Colossus, Bill Warner, Pop Warner's brother, was visiting there, see. So I opened up practice, well, here, Bill Warner was. <laughs> and, uh, Pop called us all together, you know, and we whistle, we all got together. And he says, uh, Albert, you report to Bill. Well, I did, and I reported to Bill. And uh, he says, I'm going to teach you some football. So I said, all right. I got done. When I say charge, well, charge. Well, he was a big fellow. He weighed about 260 pounds, you know, and I weighed about 160, 65. This is said, uh, go, well, I was down and he, he gave a stiff arm on his shoulder. And you know that fellow picked me up? He turned me somersault. I let over there on my back. I thought, my gosh, what's going on here? I got back there. He did that again. He did that three or four times. I just thought, well, my gosh, what is he trying to do, kill me? Well, uh, one thing he learned. He says, X, when you play football, you have to learn, you have to get up when you're knocked down. Remember that. You carry that through your life, and I did. And it took me a whole lot. When you're knocked down, you have to get up. So all of us, he says, all right, go. And say, go. I turn my shoulder. Boy, one hand went this way and the other, he missed me. He says, that a boy, now you're learning football, see. You stand there and let a fellow hit you. You got to be active. I'll just throw that over someplace, I don't need be active, see. Well, anyway, he worked with me there uh, and knocked me down for about half an hour, but I think it was an hour and a half, see. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a hot day, and uh, finally Pop Warner got through his drill, you know, and blew his whistle. That signal the first to go up, go up there. We went up there, and I was covered with sweat. I looked over Bill Warner. Boy, he was covered with sweat. And the first person is just as wet as can be. And. Uh, and I looked at Pop, he said, he took the girl, he said, how is it? I remember the girl said, he'll do. That's the only thing I heard, he'll do. Well, anyway, after that, I got in the 
scrimmage game, see. And boy, I've been used old Bill Warner's tactics. I wasn't worried they could hit me, and I was whatever dodging. I was a quick charger, you know. First thing I knew, uh, I was about to make the team. But this is what happened. I ain't got so much to relate. I hate to relate some of this stuff, but then um, I feel like I, I shouldn't. But uh, anyway, uh, I had a very ungovernable temper at the same time. Anybody did anything to me, what well, <laughs> I was going to get it back on him, see? So I was playing uh, defensive, see, tackle, and I had a fellow named Bull Williams played fullback. Oh, boy, he could hit that line just as hard as anything I ever saw. He tried to hit the left side of the line. I mean, right, I was playing right tackle, trying to hit uh, left side, I was playing right tackle defensively. He hit me over there and he came through that, I tackled him. <laughs> and stopped him. It's the first time he didn't stop cold. And he did it again, see. And he did that the third time. So I said, well, my God, I was just fell out of the So I says, he tried again. So, uh, no, I says, all right, uh, try it again. He tried again and he need me. Boy, he don't need to come right to my face, you know. And I told him, all right, try it once more. He kind of laughed, grin, you know, he's that kind of fellow. He started once more. I didn't do a thing, I was good. I hit him on the jaw and knocked him cold. Well, everybody looked at me and said, what would you do? He says, I hit him. Why did you hit him? Well, he need me. So, well, Pop didn't have much to say, no, he didn't. So, uh, anyway, we went to dinner and Carlisle's football team was made out of that uh, dinner we had, see. They had us, we ate in the athletic quarters, and we had uh, uh, separate feed, you know, see. Boy, we could eat. What I like is meat, cow meat, and so on. We often got it, you know, and we fed us good. Well, the fact that we could uh, have plenty to eat the food we wanted to eat, <laughs> everybody wanted to be an athlete, so you got the uh, athletic thing. Well, that evening, at supper time, I was so sick that I couldn't eat. I tried to eat, and my gosh, I couldn't eat. So I went to my... <coughs> Uh, room, see. And William says, Actually, you go to be in your room, or Albert's going to be in your room after I said, Yes. I said, Yes, I want to see you. So I thought, Well, here's where X gets the bag going to get beating, see. Finally, he came in, he had four or five varsity fellows with him, see. He stuck out his hand to shake hands with me, see. I didn't know what it meant, see. I had the other arm caught in my hand. If he shot at me, I was going to dodge from it and I get him back. All he says was, he says, actually says, uh, He says, you have an awful temper. He says, you can't play football with that temper. You've got to learn to cover it. But be, just before then, see, I want to relate this. I was uh, rooming with a fellow who was a YMCA student, see. 
They were religious and he had a Bible there. And uh, I had been studying the Bible too when I went to this Presbyterian mission school, see? And uh, so I was pretty bad. I took that Bible and I turned it over. And they say, hey, put your hand, put your hands on the Bible, read that uh, sentence your fingers on, well, that'd be your fortune. So I turned over, right, so here's what it says. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of a fool. I thought, my gosh, he says, that thing hits me right between the eyes. I did have an awful temper, and I did hit my captain. I did not give a cold, see? <laughs> and what a fool I was, see? You know, I remember that, that verse. It's only about five years ago that I found it and lost it again, see? But it's in the Bible. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of a fool. After that, I've been in uh, scraps in the football field where I learned to not be caught. I mean, the fella hit me. <laughs> I didn't start anything, see? But I never was put out of football field. I always kept my temper to this day. I think I've taken more than anybody else without, without uh, hitting back, see? But that has done me a whole lot of good, see? All right, so much for that. Now then, uh, anyway, this guy was saying, he says, actually, if you learn to hold your temper, I'll uh, help you with the football team. So I did, my gosh, I made it the first year I came out. Came out football in 1902, and uh, I made the team. And uh, another thing that happened, Pop was quite a psychologist and so on. It so happened, yeah, Bill Warner was up there coaching me, and uh, Lou Bo was playing uh, tackle, I think. I was playing guard. Uh, no, he was playing, uh, he was playing uh, guard, I was playing tackle. He fast charger. So, uh, one of the first large games we played against was uh, Cornell University. That was Bill Warner's, Pop Warner's uh, alumni, I see. And of course, he's graduating. And then Bill Warner was the captain of that team. I said, oh my gosh, am I supposed to play against that fellow? He was, he played against him. And Pop said, he called all the that squad, finally the captain had, the captain named uh, Jimmy Johnson. Oh, he was a crackerjack. I can tell you about his forward pass catching and so on. I will relate it later on. But uh, he was acting captain and uh, he called everybody. He says, Pop, he says, you named everybody on the position there, but who are you going to put in right guard? Oh, Papi, I never thought about that. There's a girl. I was thinking about the pretty excellent, see. When he said that, he started policy. Oh, my gosh, what's that about, see? I'm not qualified. A fellow named Dylan was supposed to be playing that team, was supposed to team in. Well, I put in, and Pop says, well, now, says, I think he called me Albert, I says, I want.